All right, good morning, Emmanuel Baptist. How is everybody doing today? It's wonderful to be in God's house. Brother Jeff Meeks, will you open us up in a word of prayer, and we'll begin our worship service this morning. Most gracious Heavenly Father, dear God, it is good to be in your house this morning, dear Lord. And I just, I just pray that you be with all the ones that are here this morning. I pray that you be with our services this morning, dear God. And, um, be with the ones that are joining us on Facebook this morning, dear Lord. And Dear God, I just pray that you be with Brother David as he brings your word to us this morning. I pray with you. Pray that you be with us during our worship time. Dear God, I pray that you be with um, everyone on our prayer list this morning. Just keep your hand upon them and their families. We just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand this morning and begin our worship with victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came me and bought me with the 
You out of breath? Yeah. yeah. I doubt that highly. <laughs> I feel <All> accomplished. Right. <laughs> well, it is good to see everybody here. Now, I just have one question looking out at the audience here. I don't know what y'all did, but y'all have run everybody off. and they are, I mean, this side's packed. Y'all have done an excellent job packing your pews showing up today. So this side over here, you got work to do for next week. Uh, but it, it's good to have everybody here today. In case you are wondering, yes, I did wear my Razorback red today. I mean, if, if it's been three years, we, we deserve to celebrate a little bit. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping it don't take another three years before we get to celebrate again. But uh, it, I think that's why everybody's smiling today. It's like, yes, the burden has finally been lifted. It's sad that that's how low our sights are set. But I'm glad that you're here this morning. Uh, there are just a few things I want to remind you of. Uh, if you are into such things, tonight is the Southeast Arkansas Baptist Network. Uh, that's our old association. It's our combined name now. But tonight is our annual meeting. Uh, it'll be at 6 o'clock at 2nd Baptist. Uh, they'll just handle a little bit of business there and then just a time of fellowship uh, to go with that. So if you would like to go, you're more than welcome to join us out there this evening at 6 o'clock for that. Uh, another thing I want to remind you of, uh, I say remind you, this is the first you're hearing of it. Uh, if you are on the personnel committee, there will be a meeting this Thursday night at 6 o'clock. Uh, we'll meet up here, I don't know, pro room, probably in the Joy class, if I'm guessing. Um, but just come up here at 6 and we'll find you if you don't find us first. Uh, don't worry, there's nothing drastic going on. It's just, hey, it's been a long time since we've met for some of these things. And so uh, there's some housekeeping things we need to take care of. So if you're on the personnel committee, uh, please meet us up here Thursday night at 6 o'clock. Uh, also, don't forget this coming Saturday, the 10th, uh, is our work day out at Wolf Creek. And so we will be out there at 8 o'clock that morning. And they've got a long list of things for us to work on. And I'm hoping, hoping that with a, enough people showing up that we can knock that list out in one day. And so, come first of the year, everything is open for retreats and camps, and the camp is ready to go uh, and be utilized at a moment's notice. So, if you can, please come out this coming Saturday. Uh, I know that we have a few things on hand, but if, if you are going to be interested in maybe cutting limbs or whatever, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to bring some of your own tools with you, uh, just so that we all don't stand around going, Hey, are you done with those loppers? Yeah, I'll take a number, and you can get to it later. Uh, but those are some of the things that we have. I know that are, are, are big items on the list. We've got some tree limbs that we need to haul off and uh, take to a burn pile, that sort of thing. So please come help us out with that. All right, uh, there's only one more thing. Uh, as you know, we had the, the rummage sale. And so I'm going to ask Miss Lena to come up and give us a report on that and uh, let us know how that went. and our audience we had a lot of stuff it didn't look like that much to me back there in joy class but when it got out there last Sunday I went oh this has got to be a God thing <laughs> and I want to thank everybody in Monticello that came and participated they it was a win-win for us we got rid of a lot of stuff and everybody got some gently used stuff and I mainly want to thank all my workers that helped from last Sunday taking it out there to people that helped on Friday, and I could call names, but I'll forget somebody. So, anyway, everybody, I just thank you very much. We made almost two thousand dollars. Amen. Woo! Amen. It's just a minute. I'm not finished. <laughs> uh, we had a business meeting. I don't know when it was. It had to have been at least three years ago. And one of our young deacons, I'm not going to say who, uh, I was trying to talk about flooring in the pantry. I'm going to fall through. So I decided to have a rummage sale. But one of these young deacons, I'm not going to say who, but uh, he said, why don't we just tear that down and build a new building? Woo! That was my go sign right there. So the, all the food, all the rummage sales that we've had, that's seed money for a multi-purpose building that we are going to build. God's going to let it happen. Thank you. you
I'm glad it went well, but I, I, I got to say that there, there's one thing, Miss Linda, I disagree with you on. Man, when we looked back there in joy class, I thought it looked like a lot sitting there in the class. I didn't have to wait for it to get out there. <laughs> but I am glad that it went well, and uh, again, thank you for all who have helped in a number of ways from donating to helping with a sale to putting out. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, just one more quick thing, and then I'll sit down and shut up, and we'll get back to worship. Uh, again, we've had Sunday school this morning for the first time in a long time, and I'm glad that uh, we had people here. We had to reset our alarm clock, which has completely has thrown me off. Uh, but we got to have Sunday school this morning. Uh, so if you ha didn't make it out today, hey, come back next week. There's some good things going on. Uh, I know everybody's a little unsure of what to expect, but I promise you it's not that bad. We're just asking the same thing as in here. Uh, wear your mask unless you can maintain some sort of distance. And then if you can, take it off. But if you get up to go to the bathroom or whatever, put your mask back on. Uh, again, when we leave today, because of that, we don't want to log jam at the back door. Uh, we'll come by and we'll dismiss you as usual. Uh, and then once you get out into that nice, warm, fresh air, you, you can socialize, do what you want to do. But uh, it is so good to have everybody back here this morning. And we're going to turn it back over to Zach and the praise team. And we're just going to keep on worshiping. Amen. We waited for this day. Gathered in your name. Calling out to Glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. Oh, you're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord of We want to see you open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power. and sing that again show us show us your glory show us show us your power show us show us your glory Lord open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. God is on the move, on the move, hallelujah. God is on the move in many 
mighty ways. God is on the move, on the move, hallelujah. God is on the move, he's on the move today. Anytime a heart turns from darkness to light, Anytime temptation comes and someone stands to fight Anytime somebody lives to serve and not be served I know, I know, I know, I know God is on the move, on the move, hallelujah God is on the move in many mighty ways God is on the move, on the move, hallelujah God is on the move on the move today Anytime in weakness someone falls upon their knees Or dares to speak the truth that sets men free Anytime the choice is made to stand upon the word I know, I know, I know, I know God is on the move, on the move, hallelujah God is on the move in many mighty ways. God is on the move, on the move, hallelujah. God is on the move, he's on the move today. I see your generation standing on the truth in each and every day saying God is on the move. Anytime the gospel stirs a searching soul And someone says, send me here, I go I know, I know, I know, I know God is on the move, on the move, hallelujah God is on the move in many mighty ways God is on the move, on the move, hallelujah God is on the move, he's on the move today, yeah, God is on the move, on the move, hallelujah, God is on the move, he's many mighty ways, God is on the move, on the move, hallelujah, God is on the move, he's on the move today, amen, bow with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your presence already this morning. Lord, I pray that you just come into the hearts of the people this morning and prepare them for your word and Lord, prepare their cups to be filled this morning. Lord, I pray for Brother David, Lord, as he comes up here this morning and, and speaks, Lord. I pray to speak through him, Lord. Lord, I pray you to bless this young lady beside me right now. Lord, just speak through her this morning. She has made a decision to come before her church. And Lord, and let her poor words speak through her this morning. I pray that you will just bless her, bless her voice, and bless the ears that the notes will rest upon, Lord. I just all these things in your name. is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows 
tears and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born jesus is calling oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ will oh, come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ oh, what a sad Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing As you wait for the crown, tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen. All right. Abigail, I'm going to tell you, they never clap like that for me, so awesome job. Well, that is a good way to start off uh, the sermon because I'm going to tell you that may be as good as it gets right there. Uh, but it's always good, not just the song, not just the presentation, but I love the song that you picked out. I love the way uh, that your heart was in it. So thank you. And it does my heart good when we see kids and teenagers saying, hey, I'm not the church of tomorrow, I'm the church of right now, and I'm going to step up and act like it. So again, thank you very much. All right, well, if you got a Bible with you today, we're going to be in the book of Daniel. Uh, the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 6 to be specific. Now, while you're turning there, I'm just going to ask you a question. How's your week been? Super good. <laughs> you know, I was, I was, that was kind of iffy. Uh, I, I really didn't know how this was going to turn out. Either I was going to get bombarded or people were just going to be silent. So I'm glad that at least one person had a, had a good week. But a, as we think about this last week, man, there has been a lot of stuff going on, not just here, but I mean around our country, hasn't there? Uh, if you're like me, you, you continue to follow the numbers of what they say COVID is doing and not doing, and now they're telling us that, hey, in a lot of places, we're seeing another spike. And I'm like, y'all are going to make what little bit of hair is left on top of my head fall out. Y'all stop giving me these numbers. But we, we, we've seen them tell us that, hey, COVID numbers are spiking again, so wherever you 
fill or fall on that. That's what they're saying. Uh, we've seen uh, political turmoil. Now, this isn't anything new. I mean, this seems like a daily occurrence at this point where one side's, you know, sniping at the other and saying this or that. But, oh, this week was great. We had a presidential debate. Now, did anybody watch it? I don't care what your political affiliation is. Can we all just agree that we saw two grown men acting like spoiled brats? And I watched that and go, oh, dear Lord Jesus, what is going on in our country? And that, that's just this week. And we see things like that all the time, don't we? And it makes us sit there and go, Lord... I can't take this anymore. Lord, this is just a little too disheartening for me to take just even one more day. And we find ourselves laying in bed at night, and as we lay our head on the pillow, we're praying, Lord, would you please just make all of this go away? Last night, my daughter uh, was praying, which is our usual nightly routine. But here's one of the things she prayed for, that COVID would just be gone so that we can get back to meeting people and seeing people. But here's why. She wanted us to be able to go out and tell people about Jesus. A lot of you are in the same boat. We lay down at night and we go, Lord, I just wish all this would go away. Or maybe we go even a step farther than that and go, Lord, forget about getting rid of COVID. Why don't you just come back and get us? That would be even better. Then we don't have to worry about anything ever again. Just come back and get us and we'll all be good. But then what happens? We all wake up the next morning. All the problems that we were talking about last night are still here. COVID, still there. Political problems, still there. All the things that we see that we were praying about the night before, they're still there. And guess what? We're still here too, which means that Jesus didn't come back yet. And that leads me to ask a question. Why? Why? Because there's still work for us to do. There's still things that he has for us to do. And I want you to understand, as crazy as our world seems right now, and don't make no mistake, it is absolutely crazy. I believe the world is turned up on its head, doesn't know right from wrong, forward from backwards. I believe the world is just absolute chaos. But I also believe this with all my heart. As crazy as our world is, God has a plan for you and I as believers in the middle of this chaos. I believe he has a plan for you and I to impact the darkness that we see around us because we have been called to be salt and light. We have been called to be difference makers. Now here's the thing. If we're going to do that, if we're going to be the difference makers that we've been called to be, we're going to have to dig down deep. And we're going to have to find some courage. Because we're going to have to face some fears that we don't really like facing. We're going to have to find some courage to do some things that maybe we'd rather not do. We're going to have to find the courage to step up and be who God has called us to be. And that's where we're going to be over the next few weeks. We're going to be looking at a variety of biblical characters that model courage for us. We're going to be looking at things like, how do we have the courage to stand up for what is right? We're going to be looking at things like, how do we have the courage to be the person that God uses in a specific moment? How do we have the courage to attempt the impossible? How do we have the courage to act when we have a godly burden? Folks, all of those are going to require us to step out on faith. All of those are going to require us to step out and do things that maybe we're not comfortable with doing. But I believe with all my heart that God is going to provide the courage for us to do that. And that's why you see the title slide for the next few weeks is going to be Profiles and Courage. I love getting to read God's Word. I love that it doesn't matter how many times I've read it, God still speaks to me through it. But I love the examples that He has given us in His Word. And as we look at these different Bible characters over the next few weeks, they're going to show us exactly what it looks like to live out your faith and have the courage to do the things that God has called us to do. Now this morning, we're going to start out by looking at a man who was faced with a hard choice. Would he stick to his convictions or would he cave to popular opinion? Would he stick to what he knew in his gut to be right? 
or were to do what somebody else told him to, even though it went against everything he ever believed. The man we're going to talk about today is Daniel. And you're going to recognize his story immediately when we get to Daniel chapter 6. But I believe this story tells us what it's going to take to stand up and have the courage to do what is right. So Daniel 6, we're going to pick up here in verse 1. It says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 side traps, those are like governors, to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these tra- satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Now time out, just so we can make sure we're all on the same page here uh, administratively. Daniel is a royal official. Now we're going to see here in just a second, he is not Babylonian, he is not Persian, he is a Jew. He comes from Judah. He's an exile from his own land. But because God rested on him, because God had been so heavily involved in his life, Daniel has risen through the ranks. And now then, it's to the point that the king says, I don't want to take care of every little affair that goes on in my country. So he starts appointing officials. Here's a satrap for you, and a satrap for you, and a satrap for you. And this is who are going to rule over you. But he knew that even with all of that, he had a whole bunch of people that would be reporting to him. He said, I still don't want to deal with all that. So he picked three officials. And all the satraps, all 120 of them, reported to these three officials. And it says Daniel is one of these three high royal officials. But did you catch what else it said? Daniel's not just one of them. He's the favorite. He's the one who has set himself apart. He's the one... There is the king's right-hand man. And so this is where we find Daniel when we get to chapter 6. All right, verse 3. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Now time out. This isn't necessarily sermon connected. But I want you to notice something here. Daniel is in a place that is well outside of his comfort zone. He is not home. He's not around family. He's not around friends. He is in a foreign government, elevated to a position of influence. But did you notice how it says he has carried out his duties? He has done so in an exemplary fashion. He has given it everything he has. He has done everything in his power to do his very best. Folks, I don't know where the Lord has you right now. I don't know if it's what you have dreamed about your whole life or not. But it is no excuse not to give it your very best. And we see here that Daniel has decided, I'm just going to serve the Lord. And he gives him his best, and God is working out wonderful things through him because of that decision. So they come, they want to trap him. And they said, well, he's kind of perfect when it comes to his job. Isn't that annoying? You ever worked with somebody like that? Oh, they're just so good. And you're like... Look, I struggled to get up this morning, and you're here half an hour early and already have a half a day's work done. I don't know what to do with you. That was Daniel. He was so good at his job, they couldn't find any fault in what he had done. So they said, we're going to have to trick him. We're going to have to trap him in the law of his God. All right, verse 6. It says, Then these high officials and sad traps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Did you catch the lie? All the high officials are in agreement here, king. This is what we think ought to happen. Just off the top of my head, I can tell you one who did not agree to that. The one that the king trusts the most. But they've appealed to the king's vanity. And they said, we want you to make this edict that nobody can pray to man or God other than to you for a month. Now, notice what the king says. Verse 8 says, now king establish an injunction. Uh, Verse 9 says, uh, therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. 
He kind of liked the idea of people giving him all that attention for a month. Verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. And then these men came by and by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king <coughs> concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. It says, Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet, when the signet of his lord's that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they've not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was excited, exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwelt in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in my royal dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be, no, shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works, and sign, works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And we hear that story, and it's not a new story to us. We've heard that since we were kids about Daniel and the lion's den. We remember how Daniel was pressed into the king's service. This wasn't something that he wanted. It wasn't something that he just signed up for. He was forcibly removed from his home and taken to a foreign country. But because he was deemed to be part of the best and the brightest, they trained him to be put into the king's service, which is a really smart, strategic, diplomatic move. They're less likely to have revolts around the kingdom if they see somebody who looks like them, who grew up like them, in a place of government. And so that's what's happened to Daniel. <clears throat> he's been pressed into the king's service. And throughout his life, as he's gone through his training, as he's worked his way up the ranks, Daniel has given it his very best. And he has proven himself up to whatever task the king gives him until he rises to this place of prominence. But that's the problem. You see, as Daniel is rising in prominence, the people that are working around him who are Babylonian, who are Persian, look at him and say, why is that Jew doing in government? Why is that kid from Judah that we forcibly removed from his home, why is he the one that's ruling over me? And we see all these other people in government around him who are native-born saying, uh-uh, he's not passing me up this time. 
And it gets to the point here where even though he is one of three, one of the king's inner three, the king says, Daniel, I'm going to put the whole kingdom in your hands. I'm going to retire. I'm going on vacation. You can handle all this. And then that was a straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. And the other ruler said, we cannot have this. And so what do they do? They start plotting. They start trying to find a way to trick Daniel and bring him into ruin. But they know it can't be in the way that he goes about his job because he's done it flawlessly. So flawlessly that the king says, I can trust you completely. So they realize Daniel is a man of integrity. Daniel is a man of deep religious conviction. And his devotion to his God is second to none. They said the only way that we're going to ever find a way to trick him and bring him to ruin is going to be in connection with his, the worship of his God. And so they get together and they devise this plan where they go to King Darius and they say, Darius, oh, you are a great king. I mean, you really are. You are just the most magnificent king we have ever had. I mean, nobody could come close to you, Darius. And they just start filling his mind with all this stuff. They said, in fact, Darius, you are such a good king. I think you ought to be recognized. So here's what we propose. We think that you, as the king, who's the only one who has the power to make this edict, we propose that you make an edict that says for the next 30 days, nobody can pray to any god or man other than you. Now what are they saying to Darius? They're elevating him to a position of worship and honor that is reserved for God alone. Now Darius, whether he really likes the idea, he's just blinded by uh, his need for adoration or whatever, says, you know what? That's not a bad idea. It'd be Darius Day all month long. And he writes it out, and he signs the edict, and he presses his signet ring in it, and it enters into the law of the Medes and Persians. And that was kind of a big deal. You know, today, if we have a bad law, they can repeal that law. They can add another law to change that law. But the laws of the Medes and Persians said, once it is written, once the king has placed his stamp, his signet on it, it's a done deal. You're not going to change it. And so he signs it, put, places his signet ring on it. Daniel would have known immediately about the edict. He would have known immediately what was coming down the line. And in that moment, Daniel has a choice to make. You know, God's been pretty good to me up to this point. He's kept me safe even though I've been away from family and friends. He's elevated me. He's given me a good job. But if I go along with this, I'm turning my back on God. I'm turning my back on my convictions and everything that I've stood for all along. But if I don't go along with it, it may very well mean the end of my life. And in that moment, Daniel had to decide, am I going to have the courage to stand for my convictions? Am I going to have the courage to stand up for what I believe to be right? Or am I going to cave to popular opinion? Now we know Daniel stood up for what was right. Yes, he ended up in the lion's den. Yes, everything that the law was designed to do happened. Daniel is in the lion's den. The king cannot change it. But when we get to verse 20, we see a, a, this conversation as the king has had a sleepless night and he runs back to the lion's den and he says some things that I think speak volumes about Daniel. I want you to look with me again real quick. Verse 20, he says, As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, Oh, Daniel! What? Servant of the living God. Remember that. And he goes on. <clears throat> he said, has your God whom you serve continually, remember that, been able to deliver you from the lions? And then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouth, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you. Those few words, that little interchange right there speaks volumes. If we want to have the courage that we find in Daniel, we get some clues right here in this passage. 
How is it that you and I have the courage to stand up for what we was right, is right, even though it seems like everywhere we turn, the world is trying to get us to compromise our convictions? How do we stand up the same way that Daniel did? Well, the first thing I want us to notice is if we want to stand firm and stand for what is right, you've got to draw your line. You remember what Darius said to him? Oh, Daniel, servant of the Most High God. See, Daniel was recognized as a servant of Yahweh. Now, this, I want you to understand, this wasn't just something that just happened in that moment. That all of a sudden, it dawned on the king, oh, you know what? Daniel's a pretty righteous guy. Daniel serves his God pretty well. He is a servant of the Most High God. No, no, no. This isn't something that just popped up and occurred to him. This is a reputation that Daniel had built up over years and years and years. That everybody who knew him knew exactly where Daniel stood. Because you see, there had become a point in Daniel's life where he drew his line. Where Daniel said, this is what I believe, these are my convictions, and I don't care what comes up, I will not cross this line. Daniel had drawn his line as a teenager. We think back to Daniel's life as a teenager. It was probably a pretty happy childhood. He probably grew up in an influential family there in Judah. He probably had everything that he could have ever wanted and more. Until one day, King Nebuchadnezzar comes knocking on the door. And Babylon conquers Judah. And hauls off all their best and brightest young men. And Daniel is part of that. And when they get to Babylon, we see Daniel has already at that point made his decision who he's going to follow. In Daniel chapter 1, we see the story of where they're being trained in the king's service. And remember, they brought all the food and stuff in. And what did Daniel say? Um, I think I'm going to pass on that. Because all the food that they brought in was considered unclean for a good Jewish boy. And Daniel says, no. I've made my decision. I have drawn my line who I'm going to follow. And this is against my convictions. And he says, I'm not going to eat it. Just bring me some vegetables and water. And I promise you that I will be just as good, if not better, than anybody else in this room. Now we know that was kind of gutsy, wasn't it? Because Daniel could have lost his life. He could have caused the, the jailer that was in charge of him to lose his life because of this. But Daniel said, you don't understand I've already decided. I have resolved. And that's what the language here tells us. And Daniel 1 says, Daniel resolved not to defile himself. He had made this conscious decision. However agonizing it was, he had decided forcefully, I'm not moving past this. These are my, my convictions. These are where I'm going to stand. And you're not going to move me off of them. Folks, I wonder how many times we fail to find the courage to stand up for what is right. Because there's just never been that moment where we have resolved that this is as far as we're going and we're going no further. There's never been a moment where we have resolved that these are my convictions and I'm going to stand on them till the bitter end. I want you to think about how many things we see around our country today where good people, moral people, go along with horrible ideas you know why because there's never been that moment where we said nope this is my line it's drawn and I'm not going any farther we've never wrestled enough with it to say these are my convictions and I don't care what you say I don't care what argument you come up with I don't care what you threaten me with you are not going to change my convictions Folks, the thing is, if we are constantly tossed about, wishy-washy, never knowing for sure what we believe and why we believe it, we will never stand our ground. It's always going to be shifting underneath our feet, and we will never stand firm. But when we draw our line and we resolve to trust God, we find the foundation to act courageously. That's what had happened in Daniel's life. Early on, he had drawn his line in the sand and established, resolved what his convictions were. And he lived the rest of his life standing upon those. 
But it's not just drawing your line in the sand. It's not just de- deciding, resolving for yourself what your convictions are going to be. Not only do you draw your line in the sand, you have to declare that line. Now, oftentimes when we think about declaring something, it's something that we say, isn't it? And some of us, you're pretty good at saying what's on your mind. You're pretty good at the declaration stuff that comes out of your mouth. But folks, here's the thing. While that is absolutely part of declaring our line, I think there's another part that sometimes goes neglected. Part of declaring our line is living out what we say we believe. We're really good at talking a good game. I can tell you all kinds of stuff, and you go, boy, that guy is just so holy and righteous. And cause, You know why? I've been around this a long time. I can tell you how to make it sound good. But if you don't ever see it lived out in me, these are just empty words. And part of declaring our line is saying with my actions and my words for everybody that is around me, these are my convictions, this is what I believe, this is how I'm going to live my life. I want us to understand something about declaring our line in that way. There's accountability there. When we declare our line for God and everybody to know where we stand, there's accountability there because I can't just go back on it later and say, oh, I I was confused. I I didn't really mean that. No, when I declare it, it's out there. And that's what happens with Daniel. See, despite the king's edict, Daniel continued to to display where his allegiance rested. Even though the king came through and said, this is what's going to happen, Daniel left no doubt where he stood. The king said, Daniel, servant of the Most High God, as the God whom you serve continuously. Daniel declared his line by living out the life that he said with his words. See, I believe that Daniel found the courage to live this life because he had accountability. Real quick, kids, you know the story of Daniel in the lion's den? But who can tell me Daniel's three friends? I'll give you a hint. First one's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, you've heard about those guys. They got a song about them. I'm not going to sing it to you, but they got one. But I believe that in that moment, Daniel and his three friends. They've gone through this together. They were taken from their homeland together. They've gone through all this together. His three friends, they're in government as well. And they are in the same position. They know what their convictions are. They've drawn their lines. They know what they're going to stand on. And as they do this together, they find a strength and courage that doesn't come alone. Daniel's friends had their own moment where they had to draw their line. They had their own moment where they had to decide what they were going to do. Remember the fiery furnace? They convinced Nebuchadnezzar to make this big golden statue. And everybody was supposed to bow down to this statue. And if they didn't, into the fiery furnace you go. And just like Daniel with the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to say, No, we're not doing that. We know who we serve. We know where our convictions lie. No, we're not going to do that. And they ended up in the fiery furnace because of it. But God delivered them. But you see, I think that experience and many others built an accountability between these four men that said, it doesn't matter what they threaten us with. It doesn't matter what goes on. This is where we're going to stand. This is what we're going to tell the world we believe. And we're just going to trust that God's going to take care of it. You ever had a friend like that? That it didn't matter how bad things looked or what could possibly happen. They always encourage you to keep trusting God. I've got friends like that. I'm going to tell you, in the darkest of times, the lowest of moments, it's those friends who come alongside you and say, don't you dare give up. Don't you quit. Don't you compromise. You trust God. Because He's going to pull you through this folks when we declare our line for God and everybody we find accountability with one another so that when hard times come we can encourage one another we can spur one another on to good works 
And that's what happens here. Folks, Daniel and his friends, they declared their line. And when that happened, they found a common courage. And here's a question I have for us. Who are you encouraging today because you've declared your line? Who is it that's looking at you right now, today, saying, man, if they can make it through this and hang on to their convictions, so can I. Folks, when we don't declare our lines, when we don't let everybody know where our convictions stand, and that they will not be compromised, there's somebody who's going without encouragement because of it. If we want to have the courage that Daniel had, we've got to not just draw our line, but we have to declare it for everybody to hear. And there's one more thing that I want us to see this morning. That is that we need to defend our line. Now I want to ask, how is it that we defend our line? How is it that we defend the convictions that we stand upon? Do we have to have all the answers? Lord, I hope not. Because if that's the case, I'm sunk. I don't have all the answers. In fact, i got a lot more questions than I have answers. No, it's not in having all the answers. Do I just need to fight harder? That sounds great, doesn't it? But I'm going to tell you, there's some days that you just don't have an ounce of fight left in you. Like, I have fought until I can't fight anymore, and I just don't think I have anything left. Folks, I'm going to tell you, I don't think defending our line is just about fighting harder, harder. It's not about arguing louder. It's not about being more forceful than the guy next to me. If it's not about those things, how do I defend my line? Well, Daniel knew exactly how. Look at verse 22. The king has come to Daniel and says, are you okay? And Daniel says, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Did you catch Daniel's defense? Did you catch what he said there? Daniel didn't say, yeah, king, I'm good because I have risen in prominence. Yes, king, I'm good because I am somebody in your government. No, he didn't say that. What did Daniel point to for his defense? God took care of me. My God, who I do serve continuously, took care of me. He shut the lion's mouth. He didn't let them hurt me. My God took care of me. Folks, we find ourselves fighting a lot, trying to defend ourselves, trying to defend our lines, but we're going about it in completely the wrong way. It's not ever going to be about what I can do better it's going to be about just letting go and letting God be God. Do what only He can do. Because you see, Scripture makes something very clear for the believer. It tells us over and over again that God will fight for us. When I am living righteously, when I'm doing what He wants me to do, when I'm standing up for the things that He wants me to stand up for, He will fight for me. Which means I don't have to be more powerful than the person who's coming against me. I don't have to be more powerful than the threat that they're bringing against me. I just have to know that my God is bigger than anything they're going to bring against me. He will fight for me. When we find ourselves fighting, standing up for what is right, folks, you can bet that God will be right there standing with you. And that's the best defense we have. Letting go and modeling a dependence on God, a confidence in God, that speaks louder than any argument we could give. When we realize that God is in our corner, we find the courage to stand for what is right. Daniel, throughout the course of his life, had said, I'm devoted to my God. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. I'm going to stand for the things he wants me to stand for. Until it got to the point where his life was literally at stake. And he says, that's not going to change it. 
The same God that took care of me when they took me from my home. The same God that took care of me when they pressed me into the king's service. The same God that has taken care of me as he has moved me around from job to job inside the government. That same God is going to take care of me right now for standing up for what is right. For standing on the convictions that he's placed inside of me. Folks, today I, I believe with all my heart that we as Christians are called to make a difference in our world. But the only way we do that is by standing up for what is right. Standing up for the convictions that God has placed inside of each and every one of us. But I know to do that, it's going to require a courage that doesn't come naturally to us. It's going to require a courage that comes from serving God and God alone. So this morning I ask you, will you be like Daniel? Will you have the courage to stand up for what is right? I hope so. Draw that line. Decide what your convictions are right now. Don't wait until the fight comes to you. Decide right now what those convictions are and stand on them. Declare them. Declare your line. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Your church members. These are my convictions. I need your encouragement to help me continue to stand on them. But when that fight comes, and it will come, when the moment comes that you've got to decide, remember the biggest strength you have to defend your line is to trust God. Trust that He's in your corner and is going to fight right there alongside of you. Today, will you have the courage that Daniel did to stand up for what is right? Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now, and Lord, there are so many things in our world that, Lord, they try to get us to compromise. They try and get us you know, to let our guard down and just to, to go with it and quit fighting. But God, I know that when you changed my heart and you made me something new, that you changed my convictions as well. So Lord, right now I pray that each and every one of us here this morning, each and every person watching online, Lord, if we claim to be yours, Lord, I pray, I pray that the convictions that we hold to, Lord, the things that we're going to stand on, I pray that they honor you. Lord, I pray that we would decide right now, Lord, we would resolve that there is nothing that the evil enemy could bring against us that's going to move us off of those convictions. Lord, I pray for accountability. Lord, I pray that we as a body of believers would be there to encourage one another and push each other onward not because we're trying to be controlling but God we just want the best for each other Lord help us to do that but Lord I pray that you would remind us that when the fight comes God we're not alone I'm not having to face anything by myself but God you are right there standing with me in my corner, fighting my battles. Father, I don't know what it is that you're wanting us to stand up for today. Lord, I know that each and every one of us has different scenarios that are playing out. But God, I pray that whatever it is you're calling us to stand up for, Lord, we would have the courage to say yes. Lord, we would do it without hesitation. Lord, we just ask right now that as we go into this time of response, that Lord, your will would be done, that each and every heart would be yielded to you, and that, God, we would just find the courage to do what it is you've called us to do. Well, we love you, and we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Today there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. times our world can be a scary place that it leaves us pretty unsettled but I want us to walk out of here this morning knowing that I can have the courage to do what God has called me to do because he's going to be right there with me this week let's do what he's called us to do let's stand up for the convictions that he's placed inside of us not compromising them because he's going to fight alongside us all right a uh, couple of announcements that I forgot earlier I know what happens uh, we started Sunday school this morning. We start Wednesday night this coming Wednesday. So uh, come be a part of that with us. Uh, kids, I hope you're as excited as my daughter was. This morning uh, we pulled in the parking lot and something was said about Wednesday night. She goes, we're having Wednesday nights too? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And she thought that was awesome. So I hope you are as excited as she is. Um, it's going to be good just to be able to be back around one another again. Uh, but we have that as well. Uh, you want to say anything?
my wife doesn't know it, but that is a really good segue in the next Sunday sermon. <laughs> Having the courage to be the person that God calls for a specific moment. And it may be that God's calling you to teach. Um, it is a good problem to have that we had so many kids in Sunday school this morning that we're like, we need another class. Uh, that's a good problem, uh, if you want to call it a problem. But uh, be, do be praying about that. Uh, just, Lord, is this, is this somewhere that you would want me? And if uh, you don't get a resounding no, then I want you to keep praying. But uh, be in prayer about that. All right, anything else this morning before we're dismissed? All right, I want to ask Jonathan, will you dismiss us this morning?